I salute all who've been involved, the students with whom I met, the panel of mediators whom I, as I mentioned, worked all through the night, and uh, literally hundreds on this campus and this community who cared and who've been involved, and who I now join with these students in asking to help us together make this a reality. We can agree, but it takes a community, not just today and the intensity of this moment, but and through the years ahead to make this a reality. Cultural diversity is and will be a, an integral part of this university. And for that, I am proud, and I know all of us in this university will be proud. every day, but they were confronted with it in the spring of 1988 when minority students took over the offices of the president. They demanded an end to the overt and institutional racism on their campus. President Coor himself admitted in a memo to the campus following the takeover, quote, our record in recent years has not been impressive. He noted a drop in black undergraduates from a high of 70 in the mid-70s to 40 in 1988. Also in 1985, the number of minority faculty had remained constant for 10 years, a meager 11. To top it off, Core added that there had been very little activity in adding courses and programs that represented the richness and diversity of subject matter embraced in the minority experience. The entire campus struggled with racism in a way it hadn't since the end of Cakewalk, of fraternity members imitating dances which black slaves were forced to perform for their master.
and day out, and I see no black and very few minority faces year after year. And when I experienced one year, four years ago, when not one black graduated from this university, then I begin to question, why am I still here? But I know why I'm still here, because I want to be here. But I also want to be able to teach non-whites as well at this university. So I'm just saying it, and I just want to quit now because I know you're cold, but I just want to say this one statement. I know what people are going to say. Why aren't there more black minority students, minority administrators, minority uh, faculty, and other racial minorities here at the university? You're going to say it's too cold up here. But do you know what? I'm from Detroit area, and it's got a half a million black people in Detroit. It is cold in Detroit. It is cold in Chicago, and it's cold in Minnesota, and it's cold in Alaska. So that is no excuse. It's cold in Montreal. of the university have been to stretch and to participate in these negotiations in every conceivable way. This occupation of the hall, of this suite, is not only in violation of the regulations and rules of the university, but it does not make it possible to continue to negotiate in the ways that the president has invested himself in to this point. I know you know that, but I need to say it. I appreciate your willingness on camera to allow me to come back in here tonight if the needs of the university require it. And I shall come and talk with any one of you and expect to be given access to me. Dr. Hennessy departed, carrying with him a set of demands from the minority students. 
These demands to President Coor, who'd been out of town during the takeover. By Tuesday morning, Coor had agreed to meet with the students to discuss these demands. To stress their conviction, most of the minority students and some supporters began a hunger fast. In addition, the minority students asked their white supporters to remain outside in solidarity. Both the participants and the supporters of the occupation were prepared to stay until their demands were met. Many long hours of negotiations were about to begin. Me, um, the action was took place in jarring of, of the scenario of what was happening that needed to, needed to occur. There was a that happened. It was different from the past because. soon arose. When President Coor attended an emergency faculty senate meeting on Wednesday to address the faculty on the situation, he revealed details of the negotiations to the press that the students thought would remain behind closed doors. The students knew that the support of the faculty was crucial in their endeavor. Many of their demands dealt with areas such as curriculum and faculty hiring that even if agreed upon by Coor were meaningless without faculty support. Thus, they thought it was unfair that only President Coor's thoughts on the negotiations were heard. In consideration of the fact that you, President Corr, have broken the trust and agreement that we've established concerning these negotiations by revealing to the press aspects of our private discussions, we have postponed our negotiations tentatively. Our commitment to these demands are only strengthened by this broken trust on revealing our discussions to the press. We have broken our negotiations to the point we will resume when we have decided it's appropriate. In the long history of attempts by the faculty at affirmative action uh, that got nowhere because the administration would always drag its feet after the faculty passed um, uh, positive resolutions in favor of it, the faculty felt the administration um, short of something like what the students did so that there was a strong sense of support for both the ends and the means used by the students to bring about the agreement. The sector of the faculty that seemed distressed by the agreement and, and objected in strenuous terms to the uh, race, racism awareness program that was being proposed for every member of the 
compulsory educational event. I think that sector of the faculty were the conservatives who historically have opposed any form of affirmative action and cultural diversity uh, on the grounds that, that, that they suppose that to be a kind of reverse discrimination that operates to the disadvantage of the white males who dominated higher education throughout its history in the United States. Um, so that those people were in effect protesting a program that of uh, race awareness that by their very protest it was clear they needed it more than anyone else in the, in the room did. But they were also a predictable group of right wingers who would always oppose regardless of how the students had gone about uh, eliciting such an agreement from, from the administration. Some professors expressed concern specifically over the tactics employed by the students. Professor Hartman, in a letter to the Burlington Free Press, declared that, quote, neither the students' right to protest nor the virtue of their goals are at issue here, but rather the coercive tactics and inflammatory ignorance presently and potentially. Such methods may well prove counterproductive to the cause of racial understanding, end of quote. These sentiments, however, were not widely shared. In the faculty, over 2,000 students signed a petition in support of the occupation, and the City Council of Burlington passed a resolution declared that, quote, let it be resolved that the City Council joins the UVM Faculty Senate, as well as numerous student and faculty groups at UVM and on campuses throughout New England, in supporting the actions and demands of the students occupying the university's administrative office. All of these groups realized that the demands presented to CORE were not new, that they'd been made many times before, but were simply ignored by the administration. No progress towards cultural diversity had been made at the University of Vermont. There was no way, I can say that now, there was no way this action could have been taken, taken place successfully if it had not been for uh, all the people who, would, who were, to put it just idiotically, for lack of a better phrase, who were outside, who were sitting outside and working and supporting. And um, nobody would have been swayed. It would have been regarded as just a minority thing. Uh, these kids are, are making trouble. And when we were we were there, and it was it was the spirits were running low, and, and and things were very tense and filled, and you know I think the depression was setting in, and uh, I looked outside the window, and the top cats were were filing in, and everyone was like, well, what, what's going on here? This, because it's a glee club of, of UVM, and you think, what the hell is a glee club, club of UVM doing? And they, they got outside, and they gave a little impromptu show, a little impromptu kind of concert. And, you know, I, I'm not going to assume errors and say why they did it or what they were doing. They were essentially, though, to me, they were supporting us, and they were giving their support by singing, you know, outside the building. And it was one of the best feelings of, of, of that week.
was a whole network of people on the outside. And we had many, many different roles to take on and play. Um, every single night and spent the night, at least 20 of us every night. Some nights there were up to 30 of us. And we held meetings so every night around dinner time. And at those meetings, the things that needed to be done and decide how to execute those things. And among the things that we did was, for instance, we had a rally that Friday, I believe. It's been some time now. And the rally was actually one of the biggest we've ever seen at UVM. There were, I'd say, 100, 150 people in attendance. And I actually called professors and speakers that morning to speak at the rally. And with a lot of enthusiasm for what we have learning going on. The history department used to be black history. It was last taught, up until a uh, time I will mention to you in a moment, it was last taught in 1977. It stayed in the catalog, but it was never offered. Two years ago, history came to the, Depart the College of Arts and Sciences and said, we want to drop this course. They made a decision to drop the course with no input whatsoever from anyone who was a minority. And in arts and science faculty meeting, I used the term institutionally racist and drew astonished stares from history department faculty members. But that decision was, in fact, institutionally racist. It was literally a decision made by white people about a curriculum issue that concerned white and black people and concerned students. I first found out about the protest in class. Uh, a friend of mine came and decided to class that a bunch of students had uh, occupied the president um, and were protesting for more minority uh, recruitment on campus. So that was the general idea we got. Um, after class was we're done in the afternoon, uh, a friend of mine and I went down to see what was going on. And we saw there's a lot of people there supporting, they were having meetings. And at first we were rather annoyed at the concept of taking over the president's office. Um, we felt that actions like that at a university seemed to be a bit extreme. Um, so we first got up a bunch of sauce uh, what was going on with the people there, the people involved. And our, our, re our main reason was we didn't um, like the idea of students um, electing themselves to take over the president's office at the university and basically dictate university policy on behalf of the other uh, 7,990 or 88 or however many other students there were. Negotiations resumed on Thursday, but the two parties could not come to an agreement on a number of key issues. The frustration of the protesters mounted, and in light of the fact that two of the hunger strikers already required medical attention, many could continue. Moreover, Clore had already indicated that should negotiations stall, he was prepared to end the occupation. To avoid a confrontation both inside and outside the offices, the students and President Coor decided to appoint three faculty mediators. Time was running out. Um, if we agreed something, if I commit to something that's not legal, then it's void. And I won't knowingly do that because I don't want to be involved in something that won't, that won't be legal, but also because I don't want to agree to something that I know can't work. I think that's just not right. Maybe it is time that um, we each ask someone to um, represent us, that we work on the documents, that we put it on a expedited and non-stop basis. Uh, mediators can solve a lot of problems. They can work on language. They can pull language together. Um, I wonder if it isn't time to do that. Students initially nominated me to be their representative. And Larry McCrory is the Dean of Allied Health Sciences. We then agreed upon as the third party to this mediation, as the third mediator. Uh, we then met uh, by ourselves and discussed how we would conduct the mediation. Then we went and spoke to initially the students and then to the administration. Uh, and we then formulated some proposals as, as compromises and as mechanisms for um, uh, resolving what we understood to be outstanding uh, uh, disputes between the two parties.
on all of the points under discussion and uh, on the completion of that agreement. An agreement reached thanks to the skillful and extraordinary help of our panel of mediators working all night long with all of us all through the night that I have signed the agreements that uh, we have reached and will mm -hmm. proceed immediately to put them into effect. The spirit of these negotiations, the common ground with which I think we all began, uh, I and my colleagues in the administration, members of the faculty, and students who've been interested in this throughout is a spirit I think we have preserved to date. They have been intense, serious, probing discussions where we allowed no difference to deter us and where we searched always for a common way to express what was from the beginning and I believe now clearly enshrined in our agreement um, a common desire and now commitment to significantly increase cultural diversity and minority presence on this campus. I salute all who've been involved, the students with whom I met, the panel of mediators whom I, as I mentioned, worked all through the night and uh, literally hundreds of community who cared and who've been involved and who I now join with these students in asking to help us together make this a reality. We can agree, but it takes a community, not just today and the intensity of this moment, month, and through the years ahead to make this a reality. Cultural diversity is and will be a, an integral part of this university. And for that, I am proud, and I know all of us in everybody pulled through for us. Um. And the university might tell you that it voluntarily ended Cakewalk in 1969, but the truth of the matter is it ended only after a group of black St. Michael's College students were involved in a kind of fraternity students over Cakewalk in 1969, and the threat of violence was so severe that the university had to take extraordinary measures to call a special meeting of the Board of Trustees and abolish it. And at that time, this was uh, during the presidency of Lyman Rowell, which was three presidents ago. The university trustees got together, got together, rang their hands and said, it's time for the University of Vermont to play its role in creating a culturally diverse society. And they made a very uh, uh, aggressive commitment to, rec to recruit minority students. And they said this in the spring of 1969. So last night when I turned on the news and I saw that there were students sitting in at the president's office demanding uh, improved uh, uh, minority recruitment, I felt I had entered a time warp. Nothing had changed. And I heard President Kaur saying, well, uh, we'll sit down and negotiate what the university's commitment of minority recruitment will be. Well, folks, I got news for you. You don't have to ask them to do anything more than they committed to do in 1969. So my suggestion to the students who are sitting in the president's office is to dig up the resolutions that the trustees of this university made in the spring of 1969 and simply ask this administration to do it. Yeah. It's all the question. It's just to do it. Another myth. This is not just for people of color, because what we do good for people of color will benefit everybody. Everybody. If we're people good, I think we're going to have that tendency to treat other people the same way. And that's got to happen. So when you hear someone in a classroom go, oh, there's just a bunch of white kids in the school, first of all, tell them about 90% of the kids here are white anyway, and tell them that racism is not a black problem, it's a problem for everybody.